What we have is an opportunity this morning to think about um, what James tells us in James chapter 5. The other day, my wife and my sister and the kids went to the shops on the square under the courthouse, the courthouse shops, and I had the honor of uh, walking our dog, and I was able to sit out and just kind of observe things, and do you know people don't always obey the crossing guard signs? They, they, this means for some walk, and for others the walk symbol seems to say don't walk because people don't really observe these things. Well, we also have in our uh, town these new speed limit signs in Crown Point. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, they're like, hey, great job, have a good day, or slow down, and they're telling you your speed. And um, these, are, these are warning signs, right? These are things that they put out to try to help us to obey the law, and the laws are made for the most part to uh, keep our society safe. I'm not sure about the 12-mile-an-hour signs in Wittenberg. I think that's a translation of 20, uh, what would it be, kilometers per hour or something, because they translated over from the German, and I, that's about 20 to 12 is about right, I think. But, um, but there are things in our society that we hear that are warnings that we don't always abide by or that we don't always heed to. But what about a smoke alarm? Now, if you're cooking and you know where the smoke came from, sometimes it's like, go, hey, go fan the, open some windows and whatever, we understand. But if you woke up in the middle of the night and the smoke alarm was going off, would you kind of consider heeding the warning or would you act upon it? Now, reference while you're sleeping because then it wasn't you who caused the problem, right? There's something going on. Maybe just a dead battery because that happens too, right? But the reality is that we have warnings in our life that we do obey or that we do respond to. What about if we have chest pains? The doctors tell you, hey, if you have chest pains, go to the ER. Are you just going to, eh, I'm going to sleep it off. Now, there are things in our life that some warnings we ignore, some warnings we respond to. I'm going to start with conversational opportunity here, church. I want to know the difference. What makes one warning worth Ignoring, and what makes another warning worth following? What is the difference? Your turn to respond towards the beginning of our message today. Preston, you look eager. Okay, so life threatening. That's a good word. Uh, is it life threatening? Is it going to affect, does it lead to death? That's a big one that people will often think about. Somebody else. I heard another phrase that would kind of be in that category. Consequences? Yep, what is the consequence of this thing? What's the worst that could happen? Death or, I don't know, you could check engine light. My car could go out and I have to have a major repair later if I don't deal with it now. I mean, these are consequences we would consider, right? Now, church, I don't know what your Bible says in chapter 5, but the heading of mine is warning to the rich. And uh, even in chapter 4, we had a warning against worldliness. And God gives us warnings. But if I'm honest, sometimes we ignore them. And other times, we say, i got to do something now. Put ourselves in the shoes of uh, Nineveh. When Jonah says, hey, 40 days and you will be destroyed. They did not wait to respond to that warning. But if I'm honest... In our American culture, there are some warnings of God's scripture that we can kind of put on the shelf, keep in mind, but not really react to. And I find that might even be true about our riches, about our wealth, about finances according to scripture that we will see this morning. So this morning I want to offer a warning against worldly wealth. Now I'll use in my question and my answer is this idea of riches, but that didn't really work as well as a title. So um, wealth, riches, finances, these all are words that I'll probably use synonymously. Um, we don't understand that wealth is not just the money we have, right? It's the stuff that we own. It's the experiences that we might get to have. But we will see today a focus on money, on riches uh, being uh, things that we can possess uh, in this passage this morning. As you're able, I believe it's next, yep, uh, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Just six verses this morning out of James chapter 5. Again, this is the word of the Lord. We stand out of reverence for him, not because I command you to, but because we hear this as not just words written on a page. These are the words of the Lord. 
James writes, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father God, there are a lot of things this morning that could easily distract us. But if we're honest, there are a lot of things in every moment that can so easily distract us. So I pray that your word would be used by your spirit to reach each of us where we are and help us to pursue where you'd have us to be. I do not think that the application of this message is for everyone the same. But God, as you lead us, I pray that we would be faithful to be doers of your word. Help us to be faithful to put our trust in you and in nothing else. To you be all the glory. For everything we have that is good comes from above. And we say thank you. God, lead us. For those of us that enter this time with heavy hearts and heavy minds and heavy schedules, God, we lay it at your feet, trusting you with those things so that in this moment we can be still. So that in this moment we can know that you are God. Help us, we pray. And allow my words to be true to your word, but also led by your spirit to transform our lives, not just inform our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Well, church, this, uh, this concept, the question I'm going to be asking, I have two answers for this morning, of uh, what must we keep in mind regarding the riches of the world? Now I say we, as in the church, as in believers, but if you're with us and you're not a believer, we in humanity also need to have certain things in mind. So whether you are saved or you're not saved, I think there's something in this idea of, of scripture that we can have, but I'll tell you that without the Holy Spirit's help, it's really difficult to keep these things not only in mind, but in front of us, uh, directing our steps. <laughs> we need God's help, because even as a believer, it is difficult to be obedient to the Lord. And without God's help, it is impossible to be obedient to the Lord. So may we understand that it is not in our strength or our knowledge that we are able to do these things. It is by the revelation of God's word and by the motivation of his spirit. And to that we need help. Now, I want us to understand that even in last week's message from James chapter 4, verses 13 and on, there was not a reference of brother, of reference to the family, and you don't see it in this one either. In fact, you do see it again in 5 verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, uh, brethren, brothers and sisters. And you see it even back in chapter 4. This idea of brothers in verse 11. Don't speak evil against one another. Brothers, right? But the reality, church, is that if we're not careful, worldly issues can creep into the church and into the people of the church if we're not careful. This isn't just a their problem, because we live in a society where it enters in. Be in the world, but not of the world, right? And we're called to be salt and light, and so we do live among the world. And if we separate ourselves from the world, we're not fulfilling the mission of God. So there is living amongst the people. It's living in the culture that we were born in. It's not shameful that God has allowed us to be born here in the United States. It's not your fault, but we have a responsibility to be stewards of what God has given us. 
And so this idea from last week of the entitlement of tomorrow, not biblical, we also have an understanding that there are foundations of finances leaning on the realities of good stewardship of money that if we're not careful can actually make us have less faith in God. And that's what we warn ourselves against this morning. So the first thing we're going to see again, two points this morning, is that we must not be jealous of decaying riches. Now, let me pause here and and teach you something that I've observed in my study this week. The same passage of Scripture can be viewed through three different lenses. The same passage of Scripture can either be read as something the Lord wants to teach me. But what is the Lord teaching me? That can be one lens that we look at Scripture. We can also look at Scripture and say, what does God want to teach you? This is your problem. I have a message the Lord needs to tell you, and we can read a passage of Scripture that way. But then we can also have a third view, which even distances it further, that this passage is about them. Now, I don't know where we are this morning in our struggle against finances, but some of us, if we're honest, are going to say, this is a message to the world. And it is. But it's also a message to the church to not be jealous of the world, to not desire things of the world. Do you know how many of us, if we're honest, would be like, man, if somebody were to gift Hillside a million dollars, do you know how much we could do with that? Life would be so much easier if we just had a little bit more money. And that kind of culture can be in all of us, if we're honest. Now, I said this in the elder meeting. I think we are right to say Jesus is Lord. He is King. But if we're not careful, this can be an analogy that might help you, we might make Jesus our president, allowing money to be our mayor. Let me say that again. A king had full leadership of society. Delegates who would tell people what the king said. Nobody else rules but the king. But in the society that we live in, democratic United States, the states are over education system, Right? The states are over the highways, correct? And the mayor might be over certain things in church. If we're not careful, Jesus can be our president, but not our king. He can be the one that's in charge, but we delegate leadership to other things in our life if we're not careful. Lord of all, to him alone, do we worship, do we give our allegiance in church? Again, finances, if we're not careful, we can build a bit of a security blanket as it were because of our good stewardship and when God takes that job from you God where are you you don't care about me anymore that can reveal to us how much we leaned upon that element of our life health relationships money these are not bad things but they're bad things to have in the place of God that's what we're going to see this morning so help us Lord whether we have or we don't have not to be jealous for the things that this world has to offer that is decaying, that is really uh, not going to last. And in this text, you'll see this passage clearly through these verses. In chapter 5, verse 1, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. We saw this even earlier, um, this idea of repentance, right? Weeping and howling. And we see it in James earlier, in James chapter 4, verse 9, where he tells them to be wretched and mourn and weep, letting your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Church, this is an idea to say, God, I'm so sorry. Now, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 tell us to search us, O God, and see if there be any grievous way in me. And that's one of the most dangerous prayers you could pray because God can reveal something about your comfortable life that he says, let go of it. For some of us, that could be money. For those of us that could be uh, relationships, children, spouses, Lord, help us to lean on him and him alone, building our house on the foundation of the rock. The church, this idea of repentance, this idea of I'm sorry, help me to live a better life. Some of us this morning need to have that response. But the text goes on. I jumped too, I'm not sure. Chapter 5, verse 2. Speaking to these people that have wealth, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Now again, this 
continues in verse 3, the gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion is an evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire, laying up treasures in the last days. Now church, I did some research and gold and silver are the metals of the earth that shouldn't ever corrode. They're the purest. That's why they're worth so much because they last for a really long time. But James says here that even those earthly precious metals are going to corrode. Rust will defeat them. Said another way, you can't take it with you. It's not going to last. <laughs> the Bible says that the, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and the old things will pass away. In that moment, there will be no more of the gold of this earth because God will make all things new. I don't care when it is, but eventually it will not last and church, this also struggles us in this way, that things corrode because of us holding on to them for a really long time. If something gets rusty by it not being used, not being oiled. And the issue here really is hoarding. It's holding on to for yourself. Not letting it flow through us for those around us. And this corrosion, this fact that this stuff is Wasting away is going to be evidence against us, and eating your flesh like fire is a reference to God's judgment. In Matthew chapter 19, we have a passage of scripture um, of the rich young ruler, right? I followed you in all things, and Jesus tells him, One thing you lack, give what you have to the poor and follow me. Um, and he tells him to follow the commandments, and the man's like, I did. And, Go sell what you have. And the man walks away sad, right? He's sorrowful. And then Jesus teaches an important lesson that we need to hear today. Jesus said, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And God is, Jesus is not speaking metaphorically here because church, we are well aware that money can buy a lot of things in this earth that we would otherwise depend on the Lord for. I mean, you want to get your kid into Harvard? If you have enough money, he could be the dumbest kid in his high school and get into Harvard. Because I'm sure somebody could fill out the paperwork for you. You, you want to have the best surgeon in the world? If you have enough money, you could travel to Australia and get the surgery done. I mean, money can solve all of our problems, so we think. I'm saddened by the realities of the suicide rate among the rich and famous. But it is an important message that we all need to hear. That that does not bring happiness. When you have everything the earth wants to give you, are your friends actually your friends? Or are they friends of your money? Isn't that what the prodigal son found out? When he got all of his father's inheritance and everybody wanted to be his friend. And when the money ran out, the friends ran out. Be careful. It's difficult. With difficulty, though possible. Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person under the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples hear it correctly. They're like, then who can be saved? If the rich can't make it, how can anyone make it? And Jesus says, with man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Church, we might devote our life to the Lord, but do we have any kind of confidence in our paycheck, in our savings account, in our retirement? Are we leaning a little bit on those things just in case God puts me through a storm and I have some stability? Or is it in Christ alone my hope is found? Again, I'm not the Holy Spirit this morning, but as the Holy Spirit allows us to be thinking about these things be careful to have things, not letting the things have you. And if we're not willing to ask the question, we might be struggling with it more than we realize. In James 5, 2, it goes on, this idea of corrosion, and I mentioned that already. Um, In Ezekiel 7, 19, there is a, a passage about uh, the judgment on people that put their hope in, these, in finance. They cast their silver into the streets and their gold is like an unclean thing. 
Their silver and gold can, are not able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. It, it won't be enough. God comes and you can't buy your way out of hell. He's not going to receive your finances as a payment, the blood of Christ alone. The verse continues, they cannot satisfy their hunger or fill their stomachs with it. You want to go through an apocalypse and you have a room full of gold? Good luck eating that. You know what was important in 2020? Toilet paper. And somebody's going to want to barter with you some, for some food. They're going to want a hammer. They're not going to want a bar of gold. I mean, in the exiles and in the struggles of when nations were being taken over, what was considered wealthy didn't help them at all. But they put all their hope in it. The American dollar is, at this moment, I guess, still healthy, globally speaking. <laughs> but if the, if the nation's finances were to crash and all of our accounts were to go to zero, would we be crushed because of how much we lean upon those things in our life? Again, I think there is something for us to understand that we shouldn't be jealous, longing for a little bit more money. The other idea that comes up here in verse 3 is this idea of laying up treasures in the last days. And Jesus talks about this, right, in Matthew 6, if you want to turn there, verses 19 to 24. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about this idea of treasures. We know this very well in his Sermon on the Mount. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. That was in the James passage, remember? Corrosion and moth-eaten where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, church, it's about what are we viewing as our treasures. And the text goes on. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Then look at this, church, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then saying it as clearly as possible, you cannot serve God and money. Now, I know, again, we're in America. Uh, we have a high cost of living we frown upon those that don't work and get a wage. I'm well aware of these things. But our hope cannot be built on the finances that we've earned or that we have deserved or that we've been given. I can't say that I hate money, but I hate what it does to myself or to other people. I hate what it does to societies. I hate what it does to marriages. Many of the divorces are because of money. This thing is a gift, but it's also a destructive force. So this concept of uh, jealousy is one that I want us to have an idea of. Lord, help us not to long for the things that the world offers. But second of all, we need to be aware is that God is going to hold all things accountable. God is the judge. <laughs> He's going to, as it were, uh, do an audit. Um, I've never been audited. Um, but if any of you have, or any of your businesses have, finding all those receipts and being checked by somebody that's looking for everything, I don't say this to scare us, church, but God is going to hold us accountable. We are going to give an account for what we do and how we use it. So we see this in chapter 5, verse 4, and this is probably the heart of the issue. It's not the money that I have, it's how I get it. It's what I'm doing, what's well, what I'm not doing with it. Remember to know the right thing to do and not do it, that is sin. That was the end of chapter 4. I mean, this is the context of what he's talking about. And so in this passage here in chapter 5, verse 4, behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, they did work for you. You're a landowner, and you're Hiring out the community, that's great. Giving them jobs. But you're keeping back their money, their day pay by fraud. And those payments, those failing to pay are crying out against you. 
And the cries of the harvesters have reached out to the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now we know that there are two times in Scripture, famously, in Genesis 4, the blood of Abel cries out to God of the injustice that happened. We also see in uh, Exodus chapter 2 that when the people are enslaved, their groans reach the throne of God. The injustices of that were happening. And that's really what we see here. This is really a picture of injustice. God knows our pain. Now let me pause here, church, because there are some of us this morning that have been wronged by people, and it's like nobody even cares. There have been situations that um, a, a judge didn't favor in your, in your case, or the situations where somebody doesn't ever say they're sorry, and I'm going to tell you that God knows. God hears. And there will be accountability. There will be justice served. But this idea of injustice, um, I don't think we fully grasp it, but the people in James's day would have, because they lived in a day wages society. I've only experienced this one time, really, in my life. We went to Ghana on a missions trip. We hired people to help us build a church. At the end of that day's work, we gave them their wages. We gave them what they earned that day. Now, what I think is happening is these owners of the fields are eventually paying them what they are due, but not in time. Not, not after they did the work. They're holding it back, maybe earning a little bit more interest. Because if I pay you tomorrow, I can make interest on your money today. So it's by fraud. It's how they're getting their money. This is a problem. Injustice. That's weird. All right. In Deuteronomy 24, uh, God speaks about this even. He shall not oppose... Oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he's one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. Speaking of this, God says, you shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he's poor and he counts on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. They earned it. They need it. Give it to them. In Matthew chapter 20, remember this famous parable that God gives of the Labors in the vineyard, and at the end of the day, remember those that worked the longest and those that worked an hour got paid the same. At the end of the day, we can't really relate to this because admittedly, I think our, our culture is probably more of a monthly cycle. You have monthly water bills and monthly phone bills and mortgages, and it's kind of, do I have money at the time of the month? And there's the 15th or the 1st, and we likely get paid twice a month with our jobs. Most people do. But what if I, as your boss, paid you once every 60 days? Your full salary. I will give you exactly what you earned, but later. What if you had a bill that was due, and you're not getting money for another 40 days, and it, it puts you in a bind? And these wealthy people are not loving the needs of the people around them because they live in a world where you don't need money every day because I got all this behind me, and this person's scrapping to get food for dinner and would like to have money to go stop at the local butcher on the way home or whatever to find what he can bring to his family. It's really injustice. It's really a callous heart towards the needs of those around us. That's what James says is really a sin. And so in verse 5, uh, we live on the earth in luxury, self-indulgence. Fattening our hearts in the days of slaughter. But church, again, it's I'm enjoying life with your money, which is happening here, while you struggle waiting for me to pay you. It's really an indifference to your needs because I am enjoying what I have before I give it away. The text goes on and finishes with this phrase, you've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, some will say this is speaking of Jesus. Maybe. I do think, remember back in the, the text, James speaks of this. Uh, yep, that's going to throw you off, sorry. Um, but the rich people are throwing him into prison, remember? The rich people are, are the ones that they're like, hey, have the best seat in the house. You're going to solve all of our problems. And they're not people that are treating these people with great care. This is the church in the dispersion, the church that's being sent into cultures that they're not usually a part of. And 
They're jealous of those that have because they don't. And from this perspective, we understand that they have brought condemnation and even killing, maybe through starvation for the people that couldn't buy food or whatever. I don't know exactly the situation in that culture, but church, God does not resist us when we do not use what he's given us for his kingdom, when we have injustice in our world. So why do we so easily forget that God is the ultimate judge? If we're honest, we can live life forgetting the fact that God is on the throne and that we are someday going to give an account. So turning the pulpit around, why do you think it's so easy for us to forget that God is the judge ultimately? Maybe I'm alone. Maybe I'm the only one that forgets this. We can't see him. Yeah, we, uh, we start living life for what we can observe with our senses. God's so far off. He's in spirit. <laughs> we can't see him. What else? Complacency. For those that might not understand that word, uh, give a synonym or explain further. What does it mean to be complacent? Yeah, so we get comfortable with what we have and we live as if it's always going to be there. Just kind of enjoying life. Uh, numb to the needs of others around us maybe because we're just kind of happy with where we are. Um, to a point maybe that it affects our relationship with other people. I would say contentment is similar to complacency, but complacency always has a laziness attached to it. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah. Anything else? Why is it so easy to forget that God is going to hold us accountable? Now, maybe it's as the person that did the wrong, but maybe it's the person that's been wronged. Why is it so hard for us to remember that God's going to hold them accountable for what the world seems to have forgotten? Because that's the other side of this, right? We could be the workers that are not getting paid. And God is not blind to that fact. But why is it so hard to forget that he's the judge? It's not in our timing. Some deep truth to that. God does bring justice, but maybe not when we want it. Maybe not even in this lifetime. <laughs> it's good. Say again. Pride in our accomplishments. Yeah, we uh, ultimately might not want to be judged. <laughs> uh, God opposes the proud, but man, I, I was raised right. I took Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University class. I saved what I needed to. And my kids can go to college because I saved the money. Yeah, what if you have a medical emergency and all that money needs to be used for something else and all of a sudden the money's gone? And you need to trust in the Lord to provide. Because maybe we're relying on our pride of accomplishments. Yeah, there might be a... Jesus came back. I, I need to see. I need to touch. And Jesus lets him touch and see. But what does he say? Blessed are those who will believe having never seen. <laughs> yeah, but it would be great to touch. It would be great to see him. Church, ultimately, I think there's an issue here of neglect. Of not using what God has given us to care for the community around them. They hired people, which is great but they're not taking care of their workers. They're not doing what God called them to do in Deuteronomy. Now in James uh, 2.6, um, I referenced this earlier, but here it is in Scripture. You've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones the ones that oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Again, these are people that are not doing the Christians any favors. In the societies that they're in, these are people that have really struggled to model Christian behavior to the, the world. If you have your Bibles, you probably will have a hard time finding it, so I'll give you my page number. Uh, the book of Amos. And there is a table of contents in your Bible for a reason. So if you don't know where it is or don't have those little tabs, you can uh, 
Mine's on page 947. So um, <laughs> go to Jonah around that area. Okay, one of the minor prophets. But in Amos chapter 6, there's a, be- uh, beautifully, a beautiful parallel that I want to bring up about this idea of neglect. Because the people of Israel had been warned of a coming judgment, of being taken into exile. And it's as if their life never even changed. And so to that issue, Amos is given the words of God to present to the people of Israel. And look what it says here, verses 1 through 8. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, the place of God. To those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. Now, geographically, they felt like they were kind of untouchable because it, they would know when an issue was coming and it was really hard to get to them. And if I'm honest, America feels that way because it's really hard to conquer our town without us knowing you're coming because they're surrounded by water on these areas and Canada and Mexico. And there can be kind of a, we're okay. Now, 9-11 proved that's not real, real, realistic in New York on the mainland. And Pearl Harbor, right, in Hawaii proved that that also can happen. But we have a lot less war on our land than they do other places. Ukraine, Israel, right? I mean, there's places where there's war all the time. Uh, It's not, was there a bomb today? It was, did a bomb hit on on our street, right? They're in the area all the time. And there is a bit of a security based on geography that they had as well. He says, the noblemen of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalne and see, and from there to Hamath and the Great, and then go down to Gath to the Philistines. Now these are places that God, through Israel, wiped out in giving them the promised land. There were nations that God said, you're not going to be here anymore, Israel is coming in. And they can remember these things. In fact, they appreciate that God did these things. And he says to them, are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Verse 3, O you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seed of violence. They're like, "Eh, it's not going to come. We're okay. God said, but he's not really going to do it. Verse 4, Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches. This symbol of laziness on luxury. They eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls, not cups, and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. <laughs> They're loving life, but could care less, based on their actions, for the disaster that's coming. Do you know there is other scriptures that reference the struggle of the day for those people? Do you know what mothers were doing? They were eating their own children because the famine was bad and they couldn't get food and they were being squashed out by the exile that was coming and people are enjoying their luxury of life while the world around them is decaying so that they have to boil their own children neglect but God sees in verse 7 therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away verse 8 the Lord has sworn by himself declares the Lord the God of hosts same phrase you see in James Lord of hosts Lord Sabaoth (laughs) God of armies I abhor the pride of Jacob. I hate his strongholds. And I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. And the exile happened. And they mourned. God had warned them. And they didn't care. The church, with this passage, I shift into something that the Lord has put on my heart as an application or a thinking in regards to this. Because if we're honest, many of us love the events that America brings. I'm so excited that our family gets to go to Grand Canyon, and I don't feel like God's saying, you can't go. But if we're so busy working to play and enjoying the money that God has given us, 
How does that compare for our burden for the destruction that is coming? Like we see in Amos. And I would say as a church, those of us that are saved, do we have a burden for those who are not saved? I've asked us to be thinking about VBS for the children in your area and are we comfortable in the life we live? And I don't really want to talk to those kids. Well, what if the kids this year could find Jesus? What if their soul could be saved? Because Jesus could return before they turn 21 and find him in some low part of life. And God could use this moment to save souls. Do we have a burden for the lost? To this, I want to reference a passage in Romans chapter 9. You should know where Romans is. So you can turn there, if you will, for me. Paul, talking to the church in Rome, speaks a truth in his heart that I cannot say that I am there yet, but I'm longing to the maturity to get where he was. Look what he says in verses 1 through 5 of Romans chapter 9. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit, verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. His heart is broken over the lost souls of his people. Verse 3, highlight, underline this. This is where I desire my heart to be because Paul says, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Let me pause there, church. He said he would forfeit his salvation if his brothers of the nation would obey him would find him. Now, I don't know that I will get to the level of that where I'm like, Lord, send me to hell, but save a hundred more. But that is a burden for the lost. That is, I cannot just sit on my enjoyment of life and let them go to hell. He is passionate to share the gospel with the hurting world. He is passionate to share the bread of life with those that are hungry, the living water with those that are thirsty, the freedom that comes to those that are in shackles and chains of this world. I mean, it is on his heart that he needs to share the hope of his Savior so much that he's willing to forfeit, if he could, his own salvation. Speaking of these people, verse 4, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. Verse 5, to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Let it be. A church, Paul has a burden for the lost. Now, my conviction this morning is not to say, hey, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. But let us make sure that we're not lulling ourselves asleep with the entertainment that the world offers us because of what we can afford and forget that people are perishing. The road to destruction is wide. I'm not saying shame on you if you're going to go out to eat today, but is your waitress saved? Are you ashamed to pray in public because people might know that you're a Christian? These are fruits of what are we really living for. And let me just encourage us that as we walk, as we go, as we entertain ourselves and our children and experience the joys of what God's given to us, allow us to have a gospel perspective. That as we're going to the Grand Canyon, Lord, help me to have your eyes to see what you have in the beauty of your creation, but also the needs of the people that are around us. Maybe we need to pray for somebody or... Speak encouraging words or just listen because people are lost. They're searching. They're in need of Jesus. I do think God would have us to have a righteous view of riches. Again, I think God has put us in positions where we are for a purpose. And we see through the Bible, Nicodemus and Zacchaeus and other people that God calls in their wealth to be used for the kingdom. And I don't think in that way we would say, shame on me for having money. That's not what I don't think, I don't think the Bible teaches that. But we should have a righteous view of riches. And it really entitles three concepts. First, gratitude. Because God's the one that gave it to you. You didn't get it. 
God's the one that gave you the wisdom and knowledge to go to that college and get that degree and have that job. Make sure you say thank you to God. Don't start feeling like it's all things that you've earned, entitlement. But also we need to have contentment that what we have is enough. And we need to be generous with what God has given to us. Those would be three things I think we should view in what does it mean to be righteous, honoring to the Lord with our riches. And some of us this morning, if we're honest, might have some of those areas to work on and others other areas to work on. But if we're not thankful to God for what we have, we're forgetting who gave it. If we're not content with what we have, we want more, we want more, we're not realizing God's put us exactly where he wants us to be. If we're not generous with what we have, we're hoarding onto it. We're not good stewards of what he's given us either. To this, Proverbs 30 has an interesting passage. Proverbs 30, verses 7, 8, and 9. Two things I ask of you, speaking to God. This is actually, if you look in Proverbs 30, this is a, uh, a proverb of another person, not Solomon. Um, but it is still the cry of our heart, cry of my heart. I ask two things before I die. Don't deny them to me. One, remove far from me falsehood and lying. That's what they request of the Lord. <laughs> Keep it from me, but also keep it from my mouth, right? Don't let me be impacted by it, by what I hear, but also not by what I speak. But then second of all, he says, neither, give me neither poverty nor riches. This is that idea of contentment. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, not the food that I want, but the food that I need. Look what it says. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and I steal and profane the name of my God. Church, remember when Israel got the greatest blessing of the promised land and God's words over them? When, when you live in houses you didn't build and you eat from crops you didn't eat, you're going to forget me. And a generation grew up that did not know the Lord nor the ways of the Lord because they didn't need him anymore. He got them to the promised land and they were doing pretty good. They forgot him. But to this, let me give one last passage. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, a couple of verses here. But this is what Paul says on this idea of contentment. Again, write this down, study it this week if you have an opportunity. I think this is helpful for us. Verses 10 to 20. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. He's speaking to the church in Philippi who helped his ministry. And they wanted to, even though they didn't have the money to do it. And he says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be, there it is, content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then here's the famous verse that everybody takes out of context. I can do all things through him who gives me strength, who strengthens me. Church, God can allow us to be content no matter the situation. In plenty, and less. I preached a message, I think it was two or three years ago, about open hand living. And to that, God can give me what he wants to give me, but he can take what he needs to take. It's not mine. I'm just a steward of it. And if we're honest, some of us curl maybe the pinky God you can have everything but let me just I'll, I'll watch over this a little bit for you thanks for, uh, for trusting me you've, you've helped me mature in your, my faith and uh, I'll do it right I'll watch over it correctly and God says no give that to me and you're like no, I don't want to and, and, and he pries the finger open and he lets you hold on to it a little longer and, or maybe he takes it or uh, whatever God does I mean our Isaac's on the altar, right? I mean, there are things that were like, God, do not take this. But he wants to have it all. So this verse continues. Because they were kind to share. Uh, kind to share in his trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that I am in the beginning of the gospel, which I left Macedonia, and no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. He's grateful for their generosity. They had very little, and yet they still gave to the kingdom. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, 
but I seek the fruit of the increase of your credit. I receive full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Look at how he ends this. My God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, he's going to provide for your needs. He's going to take care of you. Sometimes he gives you a little more than you need to share with those in need around you. And let me add this to the pot because we are Crown Point Church and people live in Crown Point. There might be seasons where you need to ask for help. And do we have the, the boldness to actually admit that we can't do it on our own? Remember when we did 5G, and this is just the reality of the fruit of that labor. We were on uh, Sally Daly and uh, Chuck, or Chuck and Sally Daly's house and uh, Joe and Nancy's house on Roselle and Drive. And nobody else said they would let us serve them. Now, there might be strings attached, I don't know. But it also, like, I don't need you to do it for me. I can do it myself. I pay that company to do it. And sometimes we have too big of a pride to say we actually need help. Let me tell you, the Benevolence Fund is for those in the community. But church, if you are in a situation in your life where finances are tough and job is hard, like, reach out to us. We want to help you. Maybe that's our issue, the pride of everything we've done. But Paul says, thank you for everything that they've supplied and helped. And I don't say this as we need to increase our generosity to the church. The Lord can move on you to be a generous giver. And some people are like, did, did God really say for us to give a tithe 10%? And it is in the Old Testament, is it in the New? And one thing I learned was, it's not, am I willing to give 10? It's, am I so bold to keep 90? And reality is, am I so bold to keep 80? Am I so bold to keep 70? How much is enough for me to have for myself? How much do I need to give away to the people around me, the ministries, the organizations, the people? that God has put in our lives. So let me encourage us to know that God has placed us where we are on purpose for a purpose, for such a time as this. But let us not miss it. Because it's so easy for the worldly's view on riches to sneak into our hearts and into our churches. Don't be jealous for things that are going to decay. And remember, God is judge. And we will all give an account. I don't say that to warn you in terms of be afraid. Because he's a good judge. He loves you. But the blood of Christ might earn our place in heaven. I don't think it takes away the regret of what we could have done for the Lord. I could have just done more for you. I know. And I want us to this moment have that opportunity to say, I, I want to do more for him. And I do think our wealth is more than the money that's in our account. It's your time. So let me pause, and we gave some announcements today. We as a church want to do uh, the 4th of July parade. And I know not all of you can walk. I think if the Furmans allow us to use their truck again, there might be a couple seats in there. But we're not doing a big float this year. We're just walking because we've got enough other things going on. <laughs> but having a presence in the, in the town parade Historically, there haven't been any other churches that have even been in it. Would you be willing to do whatever you can to help us out in that capacity, whether it be walking or coming to the parade? And I know before we handed out waters, I don't know what that looks like, but or with this uh, tent thing I mentioned before, who can we invite to come to church that an outdoor service they might not come inside of a building? Church, may we just say, Lord, Lead me to the kingdom building progress you want me to be a part of. And some of that is for your family. Some of that is for you. But God's not so focused on you getting a better house that you forget about the neighbors you currently have that are perishing, that need to hear the gospel. Let us pray. Father God, I... Um, I use the word we a lot, an hour, because the same issue that we all have, I have. And so God, I pray that you'd help me and help us 
to pursue you in all things. Help us to let you be our firm foundation. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So God, if there are people this morning that are leaning on the things of the world a little too much, I pray that you would help them to realize that you've strengthened them to stand having it but not needing it. And for those of us that don't have, help us to realize that you care for us, that you're here, and that a couple extra zeros at the end of our bank account wouldn't solve our problems. Lord, meet us where we are. Help us to pursue you. But help us to realize that when we lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, it is the better investment. And the only thing we really touch here on earth that has eternal value are the people with eternal souls. So moving us to do our part, trusting you to do yours. But Lord, allow us not to be numbed and calloused by what the world offers and miss what you've asked us to do. Awaken our hearts, I pray. It's in Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.